mate came here uh, in 1968 and bought a small farm at this end of the valley which has now grown to about 6,000 acres. We, um, we were farming and grazing conventionally. Since the 1980s, um, felt that we couldn't keep farming the same way anymore. We were, uh, the soils be were becoming more acid, uh, the, we weren't getting the productivity, and we couldn't use poisons, and, and so we decided to make a major change. See that, that one there has partly worked, and that one there hasn't. It still smells like cow manure. So see that cow manure is still there, and that's where it's turned. And so we went straight to biodynamic agriculture, biodynamic farming, uh, which is a, a form of farming that goes way beyond organic. Uh, we took that extreme measure because we saw the evidence of a friend who was um, growing, he had clover with, with roots a metre and a half deep on the top of a hill in a dry season. It was just the evidence of that that convinced us that this had something to do with it. It's, it's got something going for it. So we did that. And so ever since then, we've been uh, doing everything working with nature and not against it and I've had a I've got a passion for this uh, and I've always loved being in nature since I was a little kid and I want to be able to create a, a model now that can be that is all geared to future generations We whitefellas, since we've been in this country for the last couple of hundred years, have changed a hydrated landscape to a dehydrated landscape. And again, I'm not being critical of people. I'm just saying that this is a fact of life. It's just the way it's evolved. And it hasn't happened. It's, only, it's happened over a couple of hundred years. And a lot of it has been like the frog in the boiling water, where you put the, if you put a frog straight into boiling water, it jumps straight out again. But if, if you heat the water up from being cold, put the frog in when it's cold, and heat it up very, very, very slowly, the frog will die not even realising what's happening because it happens so slowly. And that's what's happened with this whole situation of the dehydration of our landscape in Australia. So before we came here, remembering that Australia is a continent, it's the oldest continent, the flattest continent in the world. We don't have high mountains, fast flowing rivers, melting glaciers, melting snow, and regular seasons. So. The, in its an amazing uh, environmental architecture over that time, this continent became extremely efficient in, in storing the water that it did get in these, with these irregular seasons and often very little rainfall, and stored it not far under the soil. So there was a, a huge depth of of hydrated soil up to within, say, a metre of the surface, roughly. Our river systems were really more chains of ponds with water that didn't move very fast. And the life in that water and around that water was consistent with that. Like the native fish stayed in the ponds, they only really moved in the flood times. The the, the, the water and the level of the water in the river was representative of the level of the water under the whole of the floodplain. So you see the water in a, in a river now, uh, it, it's, it's really only what you see of that water. It's a bit like the iceberg theory that with the iceberg you think that what you see, what you see is what it is, but it's in fact the biggest part of it is, is under the water. With what we see in rivers, we see that water and think that is the water. But that is only representative, that's only what you see on the surface. But that water goes at roughly that same level, right under that whole floodplain. So it could go for miles and miles and miles, huge areas. So we, and remembering that water didn't move very much, and it was quite close to the bank, not very deep, not very deep in, in, in the water itself. And then the, uh, uh, and the level of the top of the water to the top of the bank was it was not that much either. So when the floods came, 
the water would just rise and spread out. So it was a very low energy, slow moving event. Uh, absolutely different to what we now have with our channels where the water just goes very fast down these channels and doesn't get out onto the floodplains except as a with a huge flood. Now, that's the way it worked. So, we now, here we come along a couple of hundred years ago and we go to conquer this environment. So we, we as whitefellas go out with our, with our hard-footed animals and with all good intent, they went out into these huge areas and, uh, and of course, the animals would go to drink where the water was and they would eat where the sweetest grasses grew, which was near the water. And so the greatest impact of animal behaviour was near the water, which was these, these ponds, these chains of ponds. Not fast flowing water, but these chains of ponds. And so the erosion would start with the, with the animals uh, first of all eating the grass away and then the sheep getting down very low and then the um, and, and then the, and the cattle actually lick the, the the soil and the rock and to get minerals so that causes little nick points that start then when the when water does move it starts to cut little tiny channels and then those then those as it rained more then those channels would start to get bigger and then because the area around the banks of the creek were bare, that would be eroded more and more and more. And I can show places here on our creek here where work was done 30 years ago by the Soil Con by Water Conservation Department. It's eroded in 30 years, at least the channel has gone down a metre and a half or so. So think of if you multiply that by say uh, six times, or more, six or seven times over, say, 200 years, that's how much incision there has been. And we've got places on this farm where it's more than 10 metres straight down, like a wall, straight down into the river. It was never like that. So we don't, we don't actually have, we shouldn't call these creeks and rivers creeks and rivers anymore. We, we should call them channels because they are channeling water. They're not hydrating landscapes. In Europe, uh, and, and in, in the countries where most of us came from originally, those who have changed the environment here came from wetter climates. So we brought our forms, those forms of agriculture with us and grazing. And a floodplain in those countries tended to be, you'd come down the, down the, down the mountains, down the hills, and if you're looking up and down a river, it was, the floodplain was more that sort of shape with the river running like this. But in Australia, generally the floodplains are shaped like that. The highest point in the floodplain is the bank. So the water didn't, is not supposed to run down the hills and across the floodplains dependent on rain and flow down the river. It's what it's supposed to have done in Australia was to flow from the river, from the creek or river, in, in, soaks into the floodplain through the sand veins that go into the clay. And that fills the whole floodplain with moisture. I want to, don't want to call it just water because it becomes hydration as it interacts with all of the life under the soil. 